Section 75 of Up One Pair of Stairs of My Book House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Muffy Rossiti. Up One Pair of Stairs of My Book House. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller. Blunder by Louise E. Cholet. Blunder was going to the wishing gate to wish for a pair of Shetland ponies and a little coat like Tum Thumbs. And of course, you may have your wish if you want to get there, but the thing is to find it, for it is not, as you imagine, a great gate with a tall marble pillar on each side and a sign over the top like this, Wishing Gate but just an old style made of three sticks. Put up two fingers, cross them on top with another finger, and you have it exactly, the way it looks. I mean, a worm-eaten style in a meadow. And as there are plenty of old styles in meadows, how are you to know which is the one? Blunder's fairy godmother knew, but then she could not tell him. But that was not according to fairy rules and regulations. You could only direct him to follow the road and ask the way of the first owl he met, and over and over she charged him, for Blunder was a very careless little boy and seldom found anything. Be sure you don't miss him. Be sure you don't pass him by. And so far, Blunder had come on very well, for the road was straight. But at the turn, it forked. Should he go through the wood, or turn to the right? There was an owl nodding in a tall oak tree, the first owl Blunder had seen. But he was a little afraid to wake him up, for Blunder's fairy godmother told him that this was a great philosopher, who sat up all night to study the habits of frogs and mice, and knew everything but what went on in the daylight under his nose. And he could think of nothing better to say to this great philosopher than, Good morning, Mr. Owl. Will you please show me the way to the wishing gate? Huh? What's that? cried the owl, starting out of his nap. Have you brought me a frog? No, said Blunder. I did not know that you would like one. Can you tell me the way to the wishing gate? Wishing gate! Wishing gate! hooted the owl very angry. Winks and naps! How dare you disturb me for such a thing as that? Do you take me for a milestone? Follow your nose, sir, follow your nose. And ruffling up his feathers, the owl was asleep again in a moment. But how could Blunder follow his nose? His nose would turn to the right, or take him through the woods. Whichever way, his legs went. And what was the use of asking the owl? thought Blunder, if this was all. While he hesitated, a chipmunk came scurrying down the path, and seeing Blunder, stopped short with a little squeak. Good Mrs. Chipmunk, said Blunder, can you tell me the way to the wishing gate? I can't indeed, answered the chipmunk politely. What with Getting in nuts in the care of young family, I have so little time to visit anything. But if you will follow the brook, you will find an old water sprite under a slanting stone, over which the water pours all day with a noise like wobble, wobble, who, I have no doubt, can tell you all about it. So Blonder went on up the brook, and seeing nothing of the water sprite or the slanting stone, was just saying time to himself, I am sure I don't know where he is. I can't find it. And when he spied a frog sitting on a wet stone, Mr. Frog, asked Blunder, can you tell me the way to the wishing gate? I cannot, said the frog. I am very sorry, but the fact is I am an artist. Young as I am, my voice is already remarked at our concerts, and I devote myself so entirely to my professional music that I have no time for general information. But... In a pine tree beyond, you will find an old crow who, I am quite sure, can show you the way as he is a traveller and a bird of an inquiring turn of mind. 
I don't know where the pine is. I am sure I can never find him, answered Blonder discontentedly. But still he went on up the brook, till, hot and tired, and out of patience at seeing neither crow nor pine, he sat down under a great tree to rest. There he heard tiny voices squabbling. And looking about him, Blonder spied a bee, quarrelling with a morning glory elf, who was shutting up the morning glory in his face. Elf! Do you know which is the way to the wishing gate? asked Blonder. No, said the elf. I don't know anything about geography. But if you will keep on in this path, you will find a dream man coming down from fairyland with his bags of dreams on his shoulder. And if anybody can tell you about the wishing gate, he can. But how can I find him? asked Blunder, more and more impatient. I don't know, I am sure, answered the elf, unless you look for him. So there was no help for it but to go on, and presently Blunder passed the dream man, asleep under a witch hazel with his bags of good and bad dreams laid over him, to keep him from fluttering away. But Blunder had a habit of not using his eyes, for at home, when told to find anything, he always said, I don't know where it is, or I can't find it. And then his mother or sister went straight and found it for him. So he passed the dream man without seeing him, and went on till he stumbled on Jack o' Lantern. Can you show me the way to the wishing gate? said Blunder. Certainly, with pleasure, answered Jack, and catching up his lantern, set out at once. Blunder followed close, but, in watching the lantern, he forgot to look to his feet, and fell into a hall filled with black mud. I say, the wishing gate is not down there, called out Jack, whisking off among the tree tops. But I can't come up there, whimpered Blunder. That is not my fault, then answered Jack, merrily, dancing out of sight. Oh, a very angry little boy was Blunder when he clambered out of the hall. I don't know where it is, he said, crying. I can't find it. Now go straight home. Just then he stepped on an old moss-grown rotten stump, and it happening, unluckily, that this rotten stump was a wood goblin's chimney. Blunder fell through headlong in among the pots and pans in which the goblin's cook was cooking the goblin's supper. The old goblin, who was asleep upstairs, started up in a fright at the tremendous clash and clatter, and finding that his house was tumbling about his ears, as he thought at first, stumped down to the kitchen to see what was the matter. The cook heard him coming and looked about her to hide Blunder. Quick! cried she. If my master catches you, he will have you in a pie. In the next room stands a pair of shoes. Jump into them, and they will take you up the chimney. Off flew Blunder, burst open the door, and tore frantically about the room in one corner of which stood the shoes. But, of course, he could not see them, because he was not in the habit of using his eye. I can't find them! Oh, I can't find them! sobbed poor little Blunder, running back to the cook. Run into the closet, said the cook. Blunder made a dash at the window, but... I don't know where it is, he called out. Clump, clump, that was the goblin halfway down the stairs. Mercy me, explained the cook. He is coming, jump into the meal chest. I don't see it, squeaked Blunder, rushing towards the fireplace. Where is it? Clump, clump, that was the goblin at the foot of the stairs and coming towards the kitchen door. There is an invisible cloak hanging on that peg. Get into that, cried cook, quite beside herself. But Blunder could no more see the cloak than he could see the shoes, the closet, and the mill chest, and no doubt the goblin, whose hand was on the latch, would have found him prancing around the kitchen and crying out, I can't find it! But, fortunately for himself, Blunder caught his foot in the invisible cloak and tumbled down, pulling the cloak over him. There he lay, hardly daring to breathe. What was all the noise about? asked the goblin, gruffly, coming into the kitchen. But as he could see nothing amiss, he went grumbling upstairs again, while the shoes took Blunder up the chimney and landed him in a meadow, safe enough but so miserable. He was cross. He was disappointed. He was hungry. 
it was dark he did not know the way home and seeing an old stile he climbed up and sat down on top of it for he was too tired to stir just then came along the south wind with his pockets crammed full of showers as he happened to be going blunder's way he took blunder home the boy was glad enough of this only he would have liked it better if the wind had not laughed all the way for what would you think if you were walking along a road with a fat old gentleman who went chuckling to himself and slapping his knees and poking himself till he was purple in the face when he would burst out in the great windy roar of laughter every other minute what are you laughing at asked blunder at last at a little boy who sat on top of the wishing gate and came home because he could not find it what what was that cried blunder but just then he found himself at home there sat his godmother by the fire her mouse skin cloak hung up on a peg and towing off a spider's silk stocking an eighth of an inch long and though everybody cried what luck and where is the wishing gate she sat mum i don't know where it is answered blunder i couldn't find it and thereon told the story of his troubles poor boy said his mother kissing him while his sister ran to bring him some bread and milk yes that is all very fine cried his godmother pulling out her needles and rolling up her ball of silk but now hear my story there was once a little boy who must needs go to the wishing gate and his godmother showed him the road as far as the turn and told him to ask the first owl he met what to do then but this little boy seldom used his eyes so he passed the first owl and waked up the wrong owl so he passed the water sprite and found only a frog so he sat down under the pine tree and never saw the crow so he passed the dream man and ran after jack o'lantern so he tumbled into the goblin's chimney and couldn't find the shoes and the closet and the chest and the cloak and so he sat on the top of the wishing gate till the south wind brought him home and never knew it Ugh. Bah! and away went the fairy godmother up the chimney in such deep disgust that she did not even stop for her mouse skin cloak end of section 75 recording by Muffy Rosigi. End of Up One Pair of Stairs of My Bookhouse. Edited by Olive Beaupre Miller.